All right. So here we are once again. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, not my first time here in town at the uh, Jam Play headquarters, but this is definitely my first weekend seminar. And uh, so I hope you guys really dig all the stuff we're about to talk about. Um, and on that topic, let's talk about what we're about to talk about and, uh, and why we're going to do the things that we're going to do. And uh, I'll kind of take a little gander at the first example here. And uh, I want to talk about kind of why I chose this material um, and how I look at this material. And also when it comes to being sort of complete when it comes to technique, but also understanding that technique isn't necessarily the be all end all of a guitar. You may find that a lot of guys that have a lot of technique or really are concerned about technique um, are kind of lacking in the, in the musical department. And, you know, uh, in, the, in the case of Bob Dylan, you wouldn't consider Bob Dylan like a shredder or somebody who is uh, going to go play Donna Lee, you know. Uh, <laughs> but what he does have is incredible music. So everybody's a little different. Our goals are a little different. Um, and uh, it really is closely related to the style of music that we're into. But what I'm doing here um, all weekend is I want to start with the foundation and the fundamentals. And, and I always preach the foundation and the fundamentals. I'm like, a, I'm like the dad of guitar these days. Um, you're always going to hear me talking about the major scale, which gives birth to the minor scale, the modes, all this stuff, and triads. Now, a little disclaimer, if you will. Um, this stuff, you may feel like you know it, but that's not really the point. The point is um, how to learn something. So if you take a look at example one here, we're going to take the regular major scale. And we're going to do it in around the second, third position. And it's going to look something like this. We have two notes on the A string. And then three notes on the D string. Three notes on the G string. Now, that's a regular major scale. And the reason why I've chosen this, this uh, shape, if you will, or this placement of the scale is because it's not just three notes per string. Um, I think that two notes, three notes, four notes, whatever you're committing to, number of strings, I, I think that also can kind of hold you back from the musical side of things. And the reason why I chose the scale is because it's kind of mixed up. There's two notes here, there's three notes here, and there's three notes here. And uh, when I say all is fair in love and war when it comes to playing music, a lot of times you may get an example like, a little off topic here, but the D minor 7 arpeggio. Notice that we have two, one, two. It's, it's just kind of jumbled up. There's one note here, two notes here. So I'm trying to get everybody sort of away from that typical kind of three note per string um, perspective. So uh, I also want to go ahead and show you all um, alternate picking. And once again, alternate picking is something that's misunderstood. I've seen a lot of students on jam play and a lot of my private lessons um, where they, they really, in their mind, believe that they're alternate picking. But they're doing kind of a, one of these things, like... Where maybe like one uh, string to the other is sort of an economy, sort of a, a rest stroke, if you will. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to over-exaggerate this picking, and I actually want to get it to where it is purely alternate. And what I mean over-exaggerate, I mean really, truly, make sure that you're going... up, down, or down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay, so with that being said, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, we're just ascending that real quick. All right, so that's alternate picking, but I also want to express kind of how you can take one idea and really uh, apply any technique to it. Um, if you do know the C major scale, you know, you could apply this, this could be pentatonic, this could be harmonic minor, whatever floats your boat. But in this case, I wanna just down pick everything now. Different sound. Here's alternate picking. Down stroking. Okay, so I want to use this, like I said, as a parallel 
on how you can approach anything that you're learning, even if it's a solo section, uh, a run, a melody. And uh, not only that, building technique. And when you build technique, you kind of have to be able to take a technique and apply it to the unexpected. That's why we have two notes here and then three. I think we're all probably used to three notes per string. Um, so the best way that I can kind of convey that idea, and a lot of this as well is based on, a lot of people ask me, how do I get faster? How do I get more uh, articulate? How do I get more accurate? And it, uh, it's so interesting, the answer is very simple, but within that answer comes a lot of hard work. So the answer is, if you play your fundamentals, your scales, your arpeggios, your triads, all this kind of stuff, and you apply your desired technique, that's when you're not only gonna have technique, you know, like a tool belt full of technical ideas, but you're gonna have a tool belt full of harmonic ideas that you can actually use when it comes to writing music or performing. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna do the same exact scale, but I wanna sequence it in a rhythmic grouping of four, another very typical kind of easy thing, but we do the same thing. I wanna down pick it and alternate pick it. So we take and start from the root note and we go and we ascend one, two, three, four, C, D, E, F. We start on the second note on D, ascend four, and third note, so on, so forth. So it sounds like this. Okay, um, that was all downstroking. Let's go to alternate picking now, and it looks about like this. Notice how when I switch to alternate picking, it creates a very what would you say? There's a bit more variety in the tone. You can hear accenting, you can hear dynamic range. Okay, so the same idea, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of uh, pivot between one and the other, down picking. Once again, try to keep both examples the same tempo. Um, let's, let's bust out a metronome for this. All right, here we go. Alternate. Sorry. Okay, and you know, I'm a lot of people talk about, you know, I'm gonna work on this, bump it up to BPM, work on it, bump it up to BPM. I don't really, I never did that. Um, I, as a matter of fact, most of the guitar players that are kind of faster players, I, they didn't really do that either. Um, I kind of come from the school of Sean Lane where you kind of just force it to work and make adjustments on the way. However, I do respect people that can have the discipline to sit down and actually go, okay, let's sit down here and uh, we're gonna actually bump it up to BPM every time. But what I, what I prefer to do is sort of just jump around. Um, this is 152. Two alternate picked. Okay, very simple, right? But you would be very surprised at how many advanced players can't focus on blocking out their surroundings um, and, and just literally going for this major scale and playing it to the click and burying the beat, they call it. You know, it starts out with burying the beat where you're right on top of the beat and then eventually. You can do things like accent certain notes, you know, accent your upstroke, which is something very basic they teach you um, in college. If you go to college for music and you, you uh, your primary instrument is the guitar, a lot of times if you're in like a jazz ensemble, they're going to convince you that the best way, and, and I agree, the best way to uh, combat the difference of tone and the downstroke and upstroke is to just up accent your upstroke to get more strength. So it sounds like this, over-exaggerated, of course. <laughs> All right, very basic ideas, but again, it's a parallel between 
this and what you're working on. So if you're working on a harmonic minor, if you're working on, you know, some sort of alternate dominant idea, this exercise can be for you. But I also think that a bigger challenge is to, once again, block out everything around you, focus and make sure that you could actually play in time and have a good feel. And believe it or not, when you get nervous or you mess up, the first thing that goes is your feel. So you kind of have to uh, focus, and that's what this, uh, these exercises are based on. So anyways, the final um, example in this little segment on example one is um, where you're going to harmonize the actual major scale in thirds. So they call you know a grouping... A lot of jam play instructors actually refer to as a rhythmic grouping like sequence in four as a numeric or a rhythmic um, sequence, whereas you have a harmonic or melodic sequence as well, such as uh, this example, where we're going to play every other note. So we go C, E, D, F. We, we play... We're skipping this note, we're skipping the D and going straight to E, coming back to D, going to F. So it kind of has a bit of a, a staggered kind of sound. Okay, so one last comment about this. Um, if you really want to push it further, although this is, this is very basic, imagine playing to a click and doing all three and alternating between the three. First time through, you're going to go... Sequence it. All right, then you can go. Okay, again, it's a parallel for everything that you can possibly use um, when it comes to scales. All right, so that'll conclude example one, which is kind of serving as a basic picking warm up. And uh, we're dealing with scales there. Uh, we're dealing with a couple of basic things like sequences. One of them's a rhythmic sequence. One of them's a melodic sequence, if you will. But this next example is a bit more, um, example two is a bit more, how could you call it, uh, one-sided. And I think it's very important because it's kind of playing with the psychological side of guitar. You'd be surprised uh, at how many people can alternate pick really efficiently and fast, but they can't down pick very well. When essentially, if you put me on mute and I'm doing this, if I'm playing exactly half that speed, look what you get. So double, exactly double that. So it's interesting. If you really think about that, you should be exactly to alternate pick twice as fast as you down pick. It, it's it, like, no kidding, Amel. But think about that. You'd be surprised at how psychological it is to where when you're down picking, a lot of guys can't really switch between down picking and then exactly twice that speed. Again, if you, if you put me on mute and just watch my hand, you can't you couldn't be able to tell if that was Look how it just looks the same. Okay? So you're subdividing and that's super important. And along with that, we're going to mix it up a little bit and this is going to be the uh, like two quick examples of what I call the gallop. And um, this whole class over the weekend here, this whole seminar is going to kind of be uh, little nuances of what you could use to build stylistically with the song. And this is something that you'll find in a lot of rock and roll, uh, primarily the heavier stuff like hard rock. Like you're going to find this in Metallica. Uh, you're going to find this in, you know, your typical Bay Area thrash bands, Metallica, Megadeth, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you're also going to find it in a lot of uh, kind of post, what would you call it, post radio rock something, screamo, I, I don't know, uh, melodic chorus, screaming verse, all that kind of stuff. But basically this is sort of a psychological thing uh, for people that aren't really into heavy metal. And it goes about like this. We're simply taking this idea and we're taking out the fourth note. So what you're getting is a gallop. You're getting down, up, down, rest, down, up, down, rest, down, up, down, rest, okay? So it is kind of tough. Uh, let's just, for the heck of it, let's just do the third fret here. All right. Two, three, four. 
two, three, four. There I am moving notes around, you know. Um, it's It starts here. Um, and I think that it's kind of tough because when I've seen a lot of people learn this, a lot of beginners learn it, and they, they become really tense. But once again, I call it kind of a psychological thing because really you're just taking out one note. And although it's easy to say that, it's harder to do it. And um, that's kind of guitar in a nutshell. It's, it's a really psychological kind of like, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff where it's easy to say, but it's not easy to do. For example, playing at really slow speeds can be very hard to do. But there is a solution for almost anything. If I was playing at a very slow speed and improvising, I'd probably do more down picking just to eliminate as much thought as possible and focus as much on the music as I could. So, with that being said, um, this example. Two, three, four. All right, people do that one really fast too. It's like kind of, uh, there's a little variation in there. But um, the other end of this that I wanna throw out there is, uh, and you can do this with major scales as well, it's kind of where you sort of reconstruct it. And instead of taking out the fourth note, you're just gonna take out the second note. Essentially, you're just starting at a different beat with the same exercise. So it sounds more like actual horses galloping like. So, rest, rest, rest. Notice my pig stroke. What's that heart song that comes to mind? Uh, U Barracuda, what is that? Is that what it's called? <laughs> However that goes. But that's, that's the idea. If you, want to, if you want an example, there it is. You're gonna find all this stuff in uh, your Metallica and, and just it, it, throughout the last like three decades, a lot of bands, um, hard rock bands have kind of done that sort of thing. So uh, once again, mixing it up, if I wanna go. There they are back to back. Right? You know, you want to take it up the C major scale, referring to the last example we were working on. I'm sure you could find some sort of uh, some sort of varying example there, but that's the idea: is you want to take it all, get it down, and don't ever underestimate it. Um, you'd be very surprised at how working on these things and listening to yourself do them. Maybe even videotaping yourself and to a metronome. You know, really striving to get it just get it to where it feels good and looks casual and feels casual. Because if it looks and feels casual, it's probably gonna sound really good. And you're gonna have more control because we are in a sense where the metronome is very important. Speaking of the metronome, let's turn that on real quick. The metronome is very important with these kinds of exercises because not only are you learning how to stay in your lane, you're also learning how to multitask, to be honest with you. Uh, a person that can play completely naked, we call it, in the nude, that means that you you can't hide behind anything. You're sitting there with this. That's the hardest thing you can do. If you want to see where you stand, take what you're doing and literally play it alone to a metronome. That's gonna tell the truth, and that's why it's the hard, one of the hardest things to do, and that's also why most people get to the studio and they literally fall apart because they've never had to play to a metronome before. Let's be honest, guys. We've all seen it, we've all done it, we've all gotten thrown off, like, you know. But one thing I will say, though, make sure the metronome is loud enough. If I can't hear it, I will immediately get off. Don't even risk it. You know, you can tap your foot all you want. You can have great time. But if you can't hear what you're playing to or with, no matter the circumstance, you're pretty much going to, you're, you're gone. You're off. You're, you're outside of your lane. So anyways, um, let's do a couple of different um, BPMs here to sort of demonstrate um, the little gallop idea. We'll start there. It's 152 once again. Two, three, 
three, four. All right, let's take it up a lot. Let's go to 192. Let's see. All right, that's 192. Let's do, let's, let's kind of just take ourselves and really put our, ourselves to the blender, so to say, and we'll try, uh, what is that? That's 132. <laughs> All right, once again, you're talking challenging. It's more challenging. Back to this whole, let's work on it and bring it up a BPM or two. Let's work on it and bring it up a BPM or two. Um, I believe that jumping around to extremes is more valuable than actually taking it up a BPM or two when it comes to uh, these ideas because that's more of a real life situation you're going to encounter with a band when somebody counts off a song and it's a little faster or let's just say you get a whole new gig and you're playing the same song with a different cover band or something. When they count off a song, um, it's going to be more realistic. It's going to be more like somebody's counting off a song faster if you jump around to different BPMs instead of just work within a certain realm. When you jump around to different BPMs, you're going to find where your comfort zone is. So, for example, when I write music, um, I didn't do this until I think I until recently, until the last five or six years, I really matured as a musician because I started looking out for things and I learned from my peers. You know, when I saw somebody write a riff and then really, excuse me, really find the right feel for it. Like, ah, it's too fast. Ah, it's a little too slow. Find the BPM that's just right. Um, that is when I just, it, this whole world dawned on me and I was like, wait a minute. Okay. I get it. You know, it's all about being able to subdivide comfortably. Some, some tempos for guitar players are like really easy to play, just like drummers. They have like heavy metal drummers usually. Um, they're really great at the like the 180 BPM kind of area. It's real fast, but it's not fast. 200 is fast, fast. That's your extreme metal stuff. 180 is is uh, fast. 160, 165. Uh, that's pretty moderately fast. But the idea is that if you've seen drummers, if you really if you talk to a drummer, they'll tell you there's certain tempos where you can do a double kick beat, right, on the double kick drum, if that's your thing. And if the, if the tempo is too slow, it can be really awkward, to really awkward, just like guitar and alternate picking, to play at a very slow BPM. And it can be a little too fast to do with one foot. So you kind of have to compensate. It's the same with guitar, right? So just keep that in mind. And uh, let's move on to something that involves more than one note at a time. And that will lead us to the next example. Okay, so this next example here is a really important one, just like all these are, where it's about um, holding it, like blocking out your surroundings and holding an idea, even though you think it's simple. The exercise is to hold the idea and play it to the best of your ability with the best feel without any variation, without any sort of uh, oopsie-daisy, you know, oh, now we're back on, you know. So with that being said... Uh, this is a little bit of variation that introduces palm muting as well, and this kind of falls in line with your rhythm playing. Uh, this is all down picking, and um, it's going to sound, it's going to be a power chord uh, on the fifth fret here. Real simple, nothing special, but the actual riff goes like this, or the idea goes like this. That's it. Notice how. I'm kind of creating emotion to where I'm not even thinking about this, but if I look at myself, I see my hand doing like a repetitive motion. Think of it as like a drummer. If you see a drummer playing a drum fill, you know, you're gonna, their hands are going to have emotion. Even if they kind of mess up the feel, they're going to have a certain motion when they roll down the toms. The, the guitar is the same thing. And when you can kind of connect with that repetitive motion, that's when your rhythm locks in and gets better. And that's when you just become a tighter player, to be honest. Once again, everybody's going to be like, oh, this is real simple. I got it. Well, can you do it for two and a half minutes without messing up at a medium tempo? Not fast, not slow, but like kind of a slower to medium tempo, you know? And that's going to sound about like this. Um... It's going to sound it's 
two, three, four. Let's get that in our head and let's really kind of work this out a little bit, a little bit faster. Right? Two, three, four. Notice how I've, my body kind of has the motion memorized, my hand has it memorized, so if I want to dig in, I can play it. I can be in the safe zone and just kind of play it really even keeled, or I can sort of do what I like to do and dig in and really kind of, really kind of just put it in and kind of push the tone like this. Two, three, four. Right? Let's take that up in speed and once again, because my body and my hands are kind of memorizing a certain motion, I can, I'm allowed to kind of go a little, I can play faster yet still have that maintained efficiency. Um, and I really think, like there's some stuff that, notice how when you have a riff that you really know, you're going to be able to play it more efficiently. It's just like, this is so silly, I say this all the time in my jam chats, it's like driving a car. Have you ever like not had a GPS option and gone somewhere, but you have no idea where you're going? You have an idea, but uh, you know, you don't really know. You're probably going to make a few wrong turns, you know? Um, if you know where you're going, if you've done it five or six times and have it memorized, it's going to be easier to, you just kind of make turns at landmarks. You don't really even think about where you're going. Playing guitar, in a sense, the technical side of it is like driving a car. The more you know your roadmap, the more efficient you're going to be and the better you're going to sound, right? So think about that riff that you know. You can probably play it faster than the riff that you don't know. As a matter of fact, let me show you this example here one more time. I'm going to give you like a... Uh... Two, three, four... Two, three, four. Alright, even faster. It's almost as if that motion is 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 giving um that's how I'm keeping my time. You know, when I hit the one, I see my hand kind of come through. Alright, so. Two, three, four. Okay, so try that. You know, that's that's something you could even do with single note strings, like a single note idea. That's even going to have a different feel to it. And once again, we can mix it up. We can go from a single note to full power chord, and that's going to that's going to totally change things. That's psychologically going to totally change things. Like I can't dig in when I go to single notes. I can't, you know. But when I play power chords, I can blindly just kind of play, right? Of course, if you're muting the guitar appropriately. So single. even notice that when I'm playing the power chords, I'm actually like pulling my hand off of the guitar. I'm not anchoring. Um, but then when I play single notes, I, you see me kind of anchor here. Um, you know, and a note on anchoring, um, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, anchoring is where you sort of, uh, your, your right hand is resting on the guitar. And uh, it's a big topic of debate. Um, especially if you go to like, you know, school for performing arts or music or whatever. Uh, a lot of times your instructors are going to try to break you of that habit uh, immediately because that can lead to carpal tunnel and things like this. That's what they say, and, and of course, any, any improper technique can lead to bad things. Um, but when it comes to anchoring, there is a difference in tone. There's a difference in ability. Like when I anchor, I kind of float between both. Essentially, I would like to play completely free because I'm into gypsy jazz and they, they have, you know, they play, they don't even touch the guitar, they just kind of hover. And to me, that seems almost impossible. But for at least rock guitar, Western rock guitar, um, I find that anchoring has a certain sound and it's not so bad. It's just something to take note of. 
So if you anchor, it's cool. Uh, if you don't, if you anchor, it's cool. If you don't want to anchor, it's cool. I think really whatever makes it sound the clearest and it, whatever makes it sound like it feels good, that's the idea, okay? So try to play this. Again, don't play it fast. Play it medium and that's more challenging. Play it medium without messing up for a long amount of time. Uh, even backstage at shows that I play, people ask me what I warm up on and... Um, I think nervously twitching your body and your fingers um, presents you on stage with a nervous twitching body. Um, I think that it's harder to work out the mental side of things. Like example, sitting in a group of people backstage, bands coming in, pulling gear off stage, people, hey man, what's up? People wanting to talk to you and stuff like that. Yet you sit there and you push it all away and for 30 minutes you have your zen little moment where you're literally just sitting there playing, and the idea is not to nervously twitch, but to play it at a medium tempo where it feels good and not break that stride. That is harder, way harder, than playing a sweep tap arpeggio, nervously twitching, and just playing all this crazy, all these scales, you know? I think sitting down and playing a chord progression uh, before you go on stage is a better warm-up than, uh, than nervously twitching around. So long as you can block everything out, and play that metronome or play to your foot or play to yourself and, and don't stop until you want to stop. Okay, so moving on. We are in example four now. Man, time flies when you're having fun, I'll tell you. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now, uh, same idea here. But we're just moving around and we're making a progression. So here's the progression, and um, we're getting our left hand to move around instead of just staying static. So um, here's what it sounds like. Right, so let's break that down. Okay. Now, the one thing that I'll bring up um, is that you may notice that moving the chords around and not interrupting the actual notes can be a bit of a challenge. Um, and that's why I want to bring up um, something that can be a stylistically, like a music stylistic thing, but it could also be um, like ghost noting in a sense to where you're sort of, uh, if you can, um, if you're in a guitar key to where the open strings work for you, you can put an open note in there to make the movement easier as long as you just kind of keep the initial right hand rhythm the same. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. Um, so from here to here, all the way to here, notice how much we're moving. But, what, but you can go. Putting that open E string in there, um, it sounds cool. It gives a little bit of character to something that is uh, more basic. And that's a move I use all the time, even with technical riffs, to be able to sort of uh, maintain the proper harmony that, that has been created, you know, that you've created, as well as um, not having very jerky motions, you know, and that's something that I really strive to do because I'm a, I can be kind of frantic when it comes to playing guitar. It's just in my personality. I walk fast and talk fast, and I'm kind of a frantic guy. So I'm real sensitive to trying to smooth things out. And the guy that comes to mind for me is Steve Vai. Like, whenever he plays, it's as if, I mean, it's as if it's just in his body. Great drummers, too. It's in their body. You know, they kind of move with, you know, they, you never see just like a jerky motion, like, oh, you know. I, I kind of attribute that to making mistakes. When I see somebody go, oh, God, oh, God, that's kind of... Um, it's not necessarily a mistake, but I just try to eliminate it. Um, so when it does happen, it's um, it still has the feel. You know, it's all about the rhythm. It's all about the feel and keeping it uh, sort of natural. Um, so, anyways, here is that riff once again. Let's get the uh, let's get the metronome going here. And Amo, I have a real quick uh, note from somebody on the chat. They're saying when they look at that counting on example four, 
they see one and two and three and four and so they're just curious because your rhythm the, okay um that's twice. that's yeah that's a that's a fantastic question um i used um guitar pro for these for these pdfs here so thanks for letting me know as you can kind of see it looks just kind of jumbled so what we're actually doing is the previous example we're doing that rhythm and to kind of go back to that example just to take another look at it real quick um and we'll do it slow you're applying that exact thing to to all four of those bars so to go back to example four it's going to sound like this So it's all down picking, but I'm just kind of showing you guys where to place your accents. Um, and there's a lot of different styles and a lot of different kind of rhythmic, uh, what would you call it? Just, uh, I guess you're kind of riffing. It's a, it's a riff, but, uh, but rhythmically you're placing the accents, you know. You can switch that around. a lot of different kinds like that but you want to start small and then you can really apply that one idea to a basic progression i seriously when i wrote this little simple power chord progression i literally went okay let's do something literally and i'm you know i'm a fan of these kinds of riffs So let's get the metronome out real quick, and we will, let's pick like a medium sort of tempo here. Okay. I mean, to me, this is this is just as challenging as playing fast, because it's like, how how long can you go? How long can you hang on and, 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 and feel good, you know? So I'm sitting here, like, I'm going to listen, I'm going to listen to this first. Let's just now see. You can hear me. You, the second time through, literally, you can hear me go, oh, here we go. Then I come back in. I want to, I don't want to do that. Let's take that same tempo again, do the same thing, take a breath and get it, just get it eternalized. Two, three, four. <laughs> do that one time at a faster tempo i mean does anybody kind of do you guys feel what i'm saying have you ever sat there and played kind of just by yourself and your 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 meter is just oh, and you're, you know or you play the same song every day and then one day it's a little faster than you know how do you kind of stay in that realm you know if you don't play to a click it's you're going to have some inconsistencies which is totally fine uh but if you really want to try to at least get in the ballpark then i'd suggest um you know, I know everybody's different, but I would suggest finding your comfort zone. Like, I can tell you right now that, like, uh, for soloing, for me, 130 feels really good. Uh, 140, 150 feels really good. 160, 170, um, it's in 180, it's going to be good for fast playing, you know? I'm not going to be straining a lot, but at the same time, it may limit my dynamics. It may, if I'm playing an eighth note run or a 16th note run, it's probably going to be on or off. It's probably going to be a one or a 10. It's not going to be full of dynamics because at that point, even if you are playing dynamically at that speed, the listener just may not hear it. They just may hear, you know, a flurry of notes. And that's something that we all have to consider is how are we being uh, perceived? How are we, how are we heard? How, how do we sound to the person we're playing to? Even if you write and record a song, how does it sound to the person that's listening to it? That's something that I, I, I struggle with um, 
every time I write a record, you know, I'm always like, you know, how how is this going to sound? Is this too fast? Does it feel too slow? Um, and then I imagine people dancing in a concert hall or a venue. I imagine people, or whenever I watch uh, like a late show or I watch like a, an online concert uh, where there's people dancing, there's people moving, even if it's just like a rock band, I kind of take note of that, you know, that tempo. And that's the idea here, right? So anyways, um, let's do it fast real quick. Let's go to, let's see what 184 sounds like. All right. The only, and one of the main reasons why I can do this and I can play it at this rate, which just isn't too fast, is because I know the pattern. Three, four. So that's that's like 184. Just for giggles, let's do 200. That's like 208. <laughs> let's get tasteless here. Okay. So, a quick note on this. Uh, whenever I do this kind of stuff, sometimes I see like concert footage of a band that I play in or um, I see a jam play footage, or a video that pops up on the internet, um, or I'm videotaping myself just to remember an idea because I do that a lot. You know, I, I, I really don't try to uh, notate or tab stuff. A lot of times if I'm writing, I'll just uh, put the iPhone up, take a quick video and move on. Um, when I see that, sometimes I'm not warmed up and I go, man, that's really fast, even if I'm comfortable. To me, I can intimidate myself. I see like a video, I'm like, I can't, can I even play that fast? Oh my God, I must, you know, adrenaline is crazy. You know, I've seen video where I'm like, I can't, I couldn't play that fast right now. I'd have to warm up for four hours to play that fast. Yet, I walked on stage and did that, you know. So the, the human body and the mind is, is very interesting. It's a very, again, it's very psychological. And I think that all these examples are sort of based around rhythm playing. I say to all my students, if you want to get more gigs than the other guy, I shouldn't even tell any, I shouldn't even tell anybody this. Okay. A specialized rhythm guitar player that goes, I'm a rhythm guitar player. I don't waste my time in solos. I play rhythm guitar for other soloists. Think about it. Have you ever heard that? I haven't. Like, not these days. A person that's gonna get the gigs is gonna be specialized in an area where nobody else really is. And I think that the guy that's like, no, I don't play solos, I'm the perfect rhythm guitar player. I'm solid, I can play fast, I got all the chops, but no, I focus on this one thing. You're gonna get more gigs than I will because a lot of times when people look my name up and they see what's attached to it with all the frantic playing, they get, you know, if Celine Dion looks at my playing, she's probably gonna go, ooh, uh, yeah, no, you know. <laughs> we gotta play that Titanic song, you know. Uh, we don't need that guy to, no, no shredding. Uh, you know, that, <laughs> that's, that's what I tell myself at least. So anyways, if you really wanna specialize in something, Go for rhythm. Um, one more quick thing before we move on. Uh, the one thing that I find of teaching online, uh, the jam chat Q&As, the private lessons, all these events that we do, the hardest thing to convey is rhythm. Most people um, have the notes down before they have the rhythm down. So I wanna throw that out there because I think that all you viewers and, and myself included, I think you should be sensitive towards your rhythm, and I think you should always strive to be better at it um, because naturally it's something you have to work on. Once you get it, you got it, and then you can keep building on that foundation. But just from my experience uh, teaching, and I don't have to pull out my resume, I've noticed that the first thing that most people can't do very well is have good rhythm. So let's work on that and break the cycle, right? And then you'll just get more gigs, and then, then I'll be... You'll be hiring me, and I'll be like, can I, can I play a solo on the Titanic song? You know. <laughs> so anyways, let's move on. Um, this next example here, example five, 
um, is another way to create variation within the same realm. And we're simply using um, the same ulterior motive, but we're breaking down or breaking apart the power chords and we're separating the fifth from the root. It's actually not that technical. Let's just take the first measure of um, example five and let's just loop that so we can get into it. Um, and it goes like this. Can you guys hear the rhythm? Da -dun -dun, da -dun 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 -dun. Same exact thing as example four, I think it was. It's just broken apart across notes. It's kind of like an arpeggiation, but it's rhythmic. So. Two, three, four. I just messed that up. Not getting the Celine Dion gig. Titanic. Leo DiCaprio. All right, so um, what we're doing is we're taking that exact idea, just like the previous examples, and we're working it through the same progression. This is great for songwriting when there's monotony involved. Oh man, the first verse is perfect, but that second verse comes back and it's just monotonous. Like, what are, we, what are our options? I don't want to add too much stuff because the riff is good. I don't want to change the bass line. I don't want to do anything drastic with the vocals. Let's add some more movement to it. So uh, tracing with that concept and rhythm, the exact same uh, progression, it's going to sound like this. <laughs> So just think about that. It's kind of like elaborating. It, it's still the same riff. Let's do them back to back. All right. You guys feel me there? Any comments? You guys are you guys getting this clearly? I mean, this is this is. Simple stuff, but this has saved my butt every record I've done. If I want to create variation, um, a lot of times I can take something that already exists and just literally go, you know what, instead of power chords, let's do, uh, let's do single note stuff. But I want that rhythm. You know, that's because then the drummer, the drummer can do that. And it's going to really give that riff some pop. You know what I mean? Pop. Anyways, um, so that's the idea right there. Uh, the same things apply. It's hard. You see me jumping around kind of, and I, again, I don't like to seem frantic when I actually play. I don't like to feel frantic. I like to feel smooth and connected. Um, and if you're jumping around too quickly with this idea, you can also bounce and bank off of the open strings, open E, open A. And I think that it makes it sound more interesting anyways. And you're utilizing the guitar, because the guitar is a very imperfect instrument, but it harbors creativity. So I think that the open strings make it a challenge, but it also makes it very interesting. So um, this is not uh, tabbed out or notated in the example here. This is just kind of, we're sort of creating it as we go, but here's what that would sound like. Uh, <laughs> Get slower. I mean, that's it. That's I mean, to me, to me, that just sounds cool. What if there was a slamming beat behind that? I mean, you know, there, there you go. Um, so that, that is pretty much um, it for that example. And I hope that you guys kind of remember the small things. Um, this is ridiculous to say, but don't think too hard about all this. Just kind of let it happen. And during these lessons, you know, keep an open mind. First off, for, uh, for badges, uh, we were talking about that earlier. Um, I know we're probably opening up a can of worms and, and letting people suggest which one they want to have a badge on. Maybe we'll do like one a lesson or something like that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, in, in the chat, if you're in the chat um, so far, after, while I'm doing this, the final example, 
let us know what badge you think you may want to do. And if we get a lot of the same example or answer, we'll go with that. And if it's just a bunch of random, uh, I want this, I want that, then I'll, I'll probably uh, I'll pick it out because I have a good idea which one I want to be. So anyways, let's move on to example six. Okay, this is literally what I've kind of been doing a little bit each time. Uh, lesson one, example six, is the combination of example five and six. And it's simply just like half and half. So you have the power chord version, then you have the broken down root and fifth version. And uh, it goes like this, nice and slow. <laughs> Let's make a small adjustment. Let's not palm mute the open, or I'm sorry, let's not palm mute the single notes and let's keep it open because I think it'll give the riff a bit more of a contrast. Um, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Okay, so that's the idea. You just, and this actually, like, we'll talk about this as well while we have a few minutes left. Um, the, the most efficient way to utilize this information and not get lost in all these examples, because we do have a lot, even if it's simple information, uh, this weekend we do have a lot of material here at Jam Play, and um, it's not the easiest. Uh, when I went to school, when I was in college, it was explained to me it was explained to me, the best way it's explained to me is there's all this information blasting at you and you feel like you're just trying to catch whatever you can, right? But I think there's a deeper uh, meaning here and I think that it's literally just the concept. You know, the concept for this last hour, um, to conclude this last hour, is pretty much been rhythm playing and sticking to your guns and, you know, giving yourself time for repetition. Um, Maybe I'm just getting ancient these days. I mean, well, maybe not maybe, but that's really happening. Uh, but in my ancient mind, I've found that uh, I, I really just wasn't patient when I was a teenager and learning all this stuff. And and a lot of there's a lot of in, inconsistencies that were um, inflicted on my playing, uh, for better or for worse. You know, I think I was so hell bent on playing fast that that got me somewhere. You know, the phone kind of still rings sometimes for that, even though I don't really like doing it anymore. <laughs> um, but think about the concept here. And let's go over that real quick. Um, the concept was kind of pick it and stick it. I'm going to use some boxing terminology here because that's like the only other hobby I have. Uh, but pick it and stick it, you know, like pick it out. And then even if you think you have it, keep going. Don't speed up. Be able to do it for a long amount of time. Make sure it feels and sounds really good. And you can move on. But just a little bit, add some, once you get really good at choosing what you're doing, take something and throw it into the melting pot with it. Take a little something, like this example here. That's a great example. You know, we started out with literally this. And then we even came up with... You know, what comes next is your Iron Maidens. Or whatever, you know, your heavy metal bands. And that's what I really wanted to convey here. So um, a few parting words. Um, by the way, which badge do you guys want to do? Um, a few parting words here. Make sure you concentrate on the concept. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. And go for consistency because over time, that's going to affect you more than frantic twitching or not knowing what to do at all because you're trying to play Paganini. And, you know, that's like fitting a square peg in a round hole. You know, you can learn a little bit of information and do a lot with it or learn a lot of information and figure out how do I fit this in this, if that makes any sense. Kind of like the pyramids. Think about the pyramids. You can't literally just drop off a pyramid with a helicopter, but human beings can move a ton of stone and make this thing that's so crazy that we think aliens put them there, which maybe they did, I'm not really sure. Anyways. <laughs>
Well, we only had, uh, well, kind of two suggestions for the badge. Uh, Southern Cash suggested that five would be a good challenge, and I think Patrick419, I think maybe he's suggesting example four. So it's, well, here's another person for five, for uh, exercise five, so that seems Let's like do it. exercise five then. Okay. Because they're all, they're all really uh, basic, but remember, grab it, hang on to it, um, and, and pick it and stick it. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't move on just because you think you have it. Real quick, story time, story time. Um, I didn't know that I did this because I think I was just like an obsessive teenager, but I, the first like job that I liked that I had, <laughs> I worked my way up to working at the local guitar shop where basically I did all the dirty work. Like the, the seniors in the shop be like, hey, well, go restring that guitar. You'll learn something. And so, I, you know, go clean the toilet. You'll learn something, you, you, you know. Um, I was told later on, and I still go back and visit these guys. A lot of these guys are still my peers. Um, I was told later on that the difference between what I did and what they did was there'd be like the lick of the day, you know, at the guitar shop, like the typical like... Or, you know, whatever the lick is. Um, they would play it and be able to play it. I would play it, and I would keep playing it, and I keep playing it to the point where they want to wring my neck. Like they want to just keep playing it, keep playing it, and then I'd be able to play it like at crazy speeds. I'd be able to play it slowly. I'd be able to play it different rhythms, you know, uh, different feels, different styles. And that's the thing, man. A lot of people have preferences with music. I like heavy metal. I like. Uh, I like the bossa nova, you know, my favorite uh, artist is Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, like some people like Cannibal Corpse, you know, like everybody's different. Um, but what it all boils down to, for the most part, is that these devices are, in Western music, that means all of it, that is in, you know, half steps, in Western music, all this stuff is just, it's the same stuff, it's just applied differently. B minor and heavy metal is the same B minor as, as in a Justin Bieber song. I mean, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it's true, you know, and you got to think about that. So this is a language, and these fundamentals, you can't underestimate something is all I'm saying. That's kind of where the story time came from, is when I learned a lick and I saw the value that everybody in the shop is trying to learn it, and then when customers come in, they're like, oh, that's a cool lick. Yeah, let me try it. How do you play that? Next thing you know, the, you know, the lick is going around, and it's like the lick of the day kind of thing. Um when you see that kind of interest from all kinds of different people, this guy likes country, this guy likes metal, this guy likes jazz, um, instead of underestimating it, my idea was I want to be able to apply that lick to anything. And I think that mentality is what got me by all these years um, and still does, is that um, for the most part, I'm confident that with enough preparation, sometimes I don't have enough preparation, I can play any style. It may sound like me playing over country, or it may sound like Amol playing over metal, or Amol tries gypsy jazz, or Amol's trying to play jazz. Um, but to be a, a professional musician and to not get you know left out of opportunity, you must be able to play more than one style, especially these days. And I'm not talking about like Facebooking yourself um, in your PJs with the gaming console right here and you're like sitting there shredding till the cows come home and that's that's your presence like if you if you're into that that's fine but my thing is like throw yourself to the wolves get on stage and go try you know and when you do enough of that as tough it is as it is to fail or maybe sound bad um it's good for you because then you get to regroup and go to the drawing board and if I didn't have those gigs where I sounded bad, thank God that was a long time ago. It was before like everything was filmed uh, and uploaded. Uh, <laughs> although some of that stuff will come back to haunt me, I'm sure, where I'm wearing like a funny bubble shirt, and I'm just kidding. Um, but anyways, that's the idea. Go fall on your face, go jump on stage, and, and try to play different styles, and try to write stuff if you're a writer. But try to utilize these things and just never underestimate something because... It's the simple stuff that you're gonna, you're just gonna be very thankful that you focused on. And and one last thing, every gig I've ever gotten, where I literally was being tested, and I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I've got I've got no pride. I'll tell you, like there's been a couple of gigs where like like the last time it happened was when I played with Brett Mason. Like I got like a call two two days before the gig, I got like the set list. I mean literally, I was just kind of like, 
I didn't even know. I was just kind of like, well, what am I going to do? Like, I mean, I can learn these songs, but I don't want to just back this guy up. I want to try to really put my stamp on it and, and, and interact with him and play on his level and try my best to be there. And um, once I got past the initial shock of, of you're going to have to be up for two days straight and you're not going to stop working until you walk on that stage, <laughs> uh, once I accepted that, um, I got to work and it was the fundamentals that helped me. I wasn't trying to make, you know, if I was playing like, I wasn't trying to do like a 13 chord, I was just playing a dominant chord. I went for what works right then and there and I focused on my feel and my presence. And that'll conclude this lesson and I just hope you guys remember, if there's one thing you learned from this one is, a couple things, it's better to play at a medium tempo without breaking your stride no matter what your surroundings do. It's better to do that than it is to nervously twitch. And also, very important, never underestimate the basics. They'll save your butt. And that's it. Okay. We do have a few questions here to wrap up. What you got? Um, well, first, here we got a comment. Uh, Steve-056 sent this in pretty early on in regards to alternate picking, but he just said, uh, when you were talking about that at the beginning of the session, he just said, I tried Scatterbrain by Jeff Beck doing all down picks, then tried alternate, and that helped a okay. lot. So he appreciated your... steve what's up, buddy? He appreciated that uh, yeah, yeah. advice on that. Very cool, yeah. Once again, if, if something feels weird, try the exact opposite. That might feel better, and then go with that. So then we got, let's see, Patrick419. He thought you heard, he heard you exhale deliberately between bars. I think this was like on... One of the early examples. Yeah. Um, do you do any kind of breathing techniques with your playing? Uh, no. Um, I think I'm a little – well, good call. I was doing that, and there and that is something. Uh, but I will add in that I think I'm definitely higher up in altitude than I'm used to, so I'm kind of <sighs> – so thank, thank God there's no lapel on me. Oh, you just, you got, all you guys would hear just like nasty breathing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I am breathing. A lot of people do it, um, and – I've told people before, I'm not even sure if this is true, um, but when saxophone players blow a phrase and they play like a phrase or a line, like they've got to, they've got to uh, breathe. They have to breathe because that line they're playing a lot, you know, there is circulatory breathing. They can do that, but not, but not everybody. I think it's more of a saxophone thing. A lot of trumpet players, there's a lot of pressure there. So they'll, so they'll, take that breath in with the, and during that split second. And um, to kind of continue on to what you're saying, you're totally right. I was breathing. And when it was for two beats, you had to, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It was like for one beat. Um, and it's just something I kind of do. It's exaggerated right now because I'm, I'm way above sea level. But um, good call. And, yeah, you should try it. Like a lot of times – in college, especially, they'll get you to get to go, uh, or they'll get you to like grunt or something on that rest, or they'll get they get you to say rest. You know, um, a lot of drummers do this. Uh, as far as uh, in in college, if you go and, and go to music school for drums, that a lot of times they'll get you to actually count. Not and you'll you'll try not to because it's a little embarrassing, but they'll break you of that and they'll go, no, your diaphragm needs to move. An extra part of your body has to move to kind of. Um, what would you go, express the fact that there's a rest there, you know? So I was exaggerating it a little bit, but most definitely, man. And I, and I think that comes from horn players. They have to breathe in to blow that phrase. You know, that's, that's kind of what they do. So good call, and I was definitely doing that. From Guitar Pretender, how do we achieve endurance? Tips, oh, please. good, good. Um, oh, man. It, it, first off, we all know you're supposed to just do it constantly. Um, we all know that um, don't play fast until you got it down, these kinds of things. But really endurance, once you get the physical side, and this reverts back to this, this whole um, segment here. Uh, once you get back, once you get like on the level of the physical side and you make your decision and you have your roadmap, I'm going to uh, so-and-so's house, you know. I'm going to Chris Dawson's house, you know what I mean? Like when you actually have that in your mind your, in your body like i'm going there um i think what's left is the psychological side and the mental side where you have to literally learn how to not pay attention to your surroundings and what i mean is the phone ringing what i mean is the cell phone messaging what i mean is um 
the person three rows back in the audience um, flipping out and, and, and looking ridiculous. Or, or let's just say you're playing a gig and a bar fight breaks out, which has happened and will continue to happen, unfortunately. But you kind of have to just like, I see it happening in my peripheral vision, but I just let it happen. When I like, um, I've had people jump on stage before and and step all over my pedals, and it's it's that happens a lot, and it's stuff like that where you kind of have to be able to keep your cool and not let that commotion break your concentration, because listening equals li- listening takes concentration. If you break your concentration, your listening goes down the the gutter. So that's my advice for endurance is get, make your decision, make your decision. This is what I'm going to do. And then sit there and, and get it under your fingers. Once you get it under your fingers, take it to the, the, the BPM differences and, and find where it's comfortable and where it's not. And then once you get that, do it all the time, play it. And then most importantly, try this. Here's one that I do. This is pretty hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I've got a landline at the house, which basically just, it just rings um, and I just get solicited all throughout the day, it, but still there's a landline. It's kind of useful, you know, Hey, just call the house, whatever. Um, old school style. Um, <laughs> every time I do jam, I wouldn't say every time one out of three times I'm on jam chat, you guys will see it. That phone will ring and I'll usually go and I'll run off and hang up and then come back. But what I do sometimes is when I'm playing and the phone rings, my cell phone or alarm goes off, I won't get it on the first ring. I'll try to play it. I'll keep playing the the example, and I'll literally tell myself, I'm going to do this on the fourth. I'm going to stop on the fourth ring, and I don't break my stride. So instead of just stopping what I'm doing and going and picking up the phone, I do it on my terms, and I actually go, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop until I'm done, almost done. I'm going to do it on like the fourth or fifth ring, and there we go. Okay, cool. Put the guitar down. Go get the phone. Make sure that it's on your terms, and that is how I work on my endurance and that's what I recognize, at least recently, is that it's all psychological once you get past the physical part. So I hope that helped. Okay, cool. Um, Deanna Bond says, is the palm mute with the right hand an important part of this? I tend to do it naturally with my left hand in com- combination with the right hand. Yeah, me too. That's that's really cool. Um, it You know, I think that, and, and the word, I'm looking at the word here on the screen, naturally, and I think that's a really great word to kind of look at and to consider. Um, do it naturally. So if you do work on this, let's just say you take one of these simple concepts from these six examples, and you do work on it. A lot of times it's, it's start out uh, over-exaggerating, like alternate picking. You start out over-exaggerating and really making sure that you're up, down, up, down, and not tricking yourself because we're humans. We love tricking ourselves. I'm alternate picking. I'm alternate picking, and they're like down-picking all of it. Oh, I, I, that's all I do is alternate pick, and they're economy picking. You know, I see it all the time, and uh, I do it all the time too. Yeah, I'm economy picking. No, Emil, you're alternate picking. And it, it, so I think that um, the idea is to take this on and learn it and, and, and really just kind of over-exaggerate and make you have it exactly right. But then take out that excess motion. Take out the excess um, movement. And it doesn't have to be in the style of heavy metal or hard rock or Metallica or whatever. It can be something more like... Like, you can do that on an acoustic. You know, that to me, that, that is a parallel. That symbolizes this. So I think to kind of close up uh, your question here, to kind of like finish off the question, I think try it this way and go into this world for a second, but also realize that, that it's a parallel between everything else. Like I'm trying to get you to understand repetition and understand that you can, uh, if you do something over and over again and you get the rhythm in your head, like here's the rhythm. How about... Right? 
that's in my head. I mean, obviously, I kind of created the, the the example, so it's probably easier for it to be in my head, but that's what I try to do. And that's why when I go out and, and I play in different bands and fill in for different bands, I, the most important part for me is giving myself enough time to where I actually have those rhythms eternalized. So believe it or not, the most important part about learning music is on the airplane, is in the car, is listening to it over and over and over again, you know? And so just try that. So I'd say, once again, go for these examples, but also um, remember that rhythm is just a parallel for a Janis Joplin song, really. It's all the same. <laughs> Beatles, whatever. You know, it's all the same. Okay. Um, I think that wraps it up for this first session. So we'll see see everybody at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2 p.m. for us here in Mountain Time. Any uh, last words? Yeah, just try to, uh, any last words of advice? Pick one. Pick pick the one that you dig and just just totally obsess with it and totally get it. Just one. That's all. Because there is no right direction. A step is a step in the right direction. You can step to the side. You can step forwards, back. It doesn't matter as long as it's a step away from where you're at, okay? So thank you guys very much. What are the uh, eight or nine more sessions to go, and I'll see you in a couple hours.